titled Those in the Beloved. And um, I want you to pay close attention because my message today is more theological than it is practical. And I'm going to tread where angels fear to tread. I'm going to deal with the doctrine of predestination. And there's so much heresy out there regarding this that God forced this upon me, literally. I had a message all ready to go, ready, just let it rip. And God said, Joel, that's not what I want. So I want you to pay attention, beloved. I'm trying to make this as simple as I can. I told Brother Dave if I was preaching to a bunch of theologians or theological scholars, I could use theological terms and that would save a lot of explaining, uh, but I'm not doing that. Uh, so I'm going to make this as simple as I can because I want you to really understand this doctrine. It'll mean so much to you once you get a handle on it. So my message this morning is entitled, Those in the Beloved. Those in the Beloved. I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Those in the Beloved, let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus. In verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath redeemed us, or excuse me, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and notice the words he uses, in Christ. According as he has chosen us, here it is again, in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the blood. Those in the beloved, let's go to the throne of grace. Father in heaven, as we traverse this uh, passage, uh, Lord, this spiritual ground that we're about to enter, I pray, Father, you'd give me the words to make this simple so everyone can understand this. Father, it's so important to understand these great, profound truths that you have placed within the Word of God. So, Father, help me to convey it. Give me the words, Father. Give me the anointing that it may bless thy people. We ask it in Christ our Savior and hopefully our soon coming King's name. Amen. And you may be seated. These sublime passages, beloved, are some of the greatest passages that are in the Bible as you study them. Here Paul reveals and he speaks about all the corporate, notice the word I said, corporate spiritual blessings, benefits, and bounties believers positionally receive, as it says in verse number 6, in the beloved, agapao. Agapao, that's that phrase. That is, in Christ, God's dearly beloved Son, His beloved Savior of the world, beloved, in His redemptive plan. Now, do you hear what I said there? In His redemptive plan. I want you to look at verse number 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame uh, before Him, <clears throat> excuse me, in love. Sometime in the dateless, timeless, eternal past, in the four ordinate councils before the foundation of the world, the most blessed Holy Trinity in unity got together and they formulated God's redemptive plan for man. Meaning this, meaning before there was a universe, before there was a world, before there was an earth, before there was an ocean, before there was a fish, before there was a tree, before there was an animal, before there was a daffodil, before there was a man, before all this, God already had a Savior in place to re redeem man long before there was ever a sinner and Adam fell in the Garden of Eden. Would you say amen? Now, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 states this, that Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Do you hear that? Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Of course, you know throughout Scripture, without the shedding of God, there is no remission of sin. All of the lambs that were shed from Adam then to Israel under the law, ultimately until Christ came, beloved, all typified, they all pointed to Jesus, whom God said, Behold the Lamb of God, 
who taketh away the sin of the world. Would you say amen out there? That was always in God's redemptive plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Meaning, beloved, that in God's redemptive plan from eternity past, he had already planned to say, send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as man's sacrifice, as man's substitute, as his sin bearer, to atone for Christ on the cross at Calvary. In other words, beloved, God both foresaw and God foreknew that both man would and could misuse his free will that God had given them. So uh, long before he ever created anything or anyone, beloved, the cross of Calvary was already an integral part uh, of God's redemptive plan that was in his mind. Would you say amen? In other words, the pre-incarnate Christ was already in place. He was just raring to go to complete his redemptive plan. But, beloved, there's something else we need to understand about God's redemptive plan. Now, listen to me. When God created the angels, God made the angels with free will, free moral agents. They could choose to obey God, and they could choose to disobey God. Amen? They were in close proximity to God. The reason Christ didn't redeem them is because they saw God. They didn't need faith to believe in them. They saw God sitting on the throne, amen? Satan was the anointed cherub that hovered above the throne that was the guardian angel of it. Now, God created these angels. They were called sons of God, and they, one-third of them misused their free will. They chose to disobey God and follow Satan, or Lucifer at that time, in the rebellion, and when he was booted out of heaven, he became Satan the adversary. That's what that word means, Amen? Now, beloved, so when God created man, God created man also as a free moral agent with a free will. Now, listen to me now. Our will is not as free as we like to think because of all the sin we have in our life. But it's free enough to accept Jesus as our Savior. Amen? So God foreknew, God foresaw that if the angels would disobey God, the angels would misuse their free will, then so wouldn't man. Consequently, God already had a Savior, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, long before he ever created Adam. Come on and say amen out there. And so, beloved, I want you to look at verse number 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Notice that another integral part of God's divine plan of salvation was that God in eternity past also determined that all those who place their faith in Christ would be blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, but it would be in Christ. Would you say amen out there? So the question is this. What kind of spiritual blessings is Paul talking about here? Well, in God's redemptive plan from eternity past, he'd already planned to redeem and save man from the penalty and power. And when Christ comes back, blessed be God from the very presence of sin itself. Would you say amen out there? So that was already in the plan of God before he created man. He already planned to justify, declare man not, uh, not guilty in the court of heaven. He already planned to sanctify man, to separate him from a secular and profane to make him a holy uh, man of God. That was in God's plan. He already planned, beloved, to conform and transform us who believe in Christ into the very image of Christ, and that's why I tell you God's always busy about the work, working in our lives, trying to do that. And he uses everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Also, beloved, he'd already planned to baptize us into the body and into the bride, and the Bible says into the building of Christ. The Holy Spirit would take us and put us right in there. Would you say amen out there? That was always in the mind of God. And, beloved, he had already planned to resurrect us. He knew man would die. The, the wages of sin is death, he says in Romans 6.23. But God, in his plan, said, they're not only going to die, but I am going to resurrect them, and I'm going to glorify them, and I'm going to transform them, and I'm going to translate them. And in my redemptive plan, I am going to immortalize them when Jesus Christ returns at the second advent. Come on and say amen out there. I'm looking forward to being immortalized, aren't you? That I can put off this broken down body. Got a lot of miles on this chassis. <laughs> Hard miles, too. And beloved, he'd already planned 
that when Jesus came back the second time to consummate his redemptive plan, that he was going to create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness so that we could forever permanently live with him in a divinized and glorified body in the eternal heavenly kingdom of God. Would you say amen? Truly, beloved, we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings, as Paul says, in heavenly places. Would you say amen? God had already had this settled before anything even happened. The schematic was in heaven. Now we just had to roll it out and work out the details. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, I want you to look at verses 4 and 5 again. He says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. It shows you that we weren't all the children of God. This world says we're all children of God. The Bible says you aren't. If you want to be a child of God, you need to get saved and get adopted into the family of God. Would you say amen out there? By Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, beloved, I want you to notice uh, that before the foundation of the world, it says in verse 4, that God hath chosen us, now you ought to circle this, in him to what? To be holy and blameless. And in verse 5, we're told that God has already predestinated us unto the adoption of children. That is, God says, once I save them and once I sanctify them, I'm going to put them into the family of God. Would you say amen out there? In fact, we are going to judge the angels. We'll be higher than the angels. What a wonderful truth that is. Now, the question is this. So who is the us that have been chosen? Who is the us that have been predestinated? Who is the us that have been adopted into the family of God. Well, beloved, I want you to look at verses 12 and 13. Then we're going to drop down to verse 19. Okay, look at verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first, notice what he said, trusted in Christ. Notice the past tense, the year is past. In whom you also trusted after that ye heard, not before you heard. Now I'm coming, going somewhere with this. I'm trying to make it so it'll stick out in your mind. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Drop down to verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? Now, beloved, the us Paul is speaking about here are us. It is we who are part of God's redemptive plan uh, that, was, uh, uh, that uh, were chosen to be able to believe the gospel and trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior, beloved. And after we did this, the Bible says we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now listen, he didn't say he did that before that in eternity past. In eternity past, he said, after they trust me, after they believe, then they're going to be adopted into my family and be the benefactors of all of these heavenly and spiritual blessings in Christ. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, part of God's redemptive plan for man was this, that salvation would be got through God's grace through man's faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not that of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So God's plan from eternity past was always that man would be saved by his, undivine, his unmerited grace through our faith. Would you say amen out there? Now, Pastor, why are you trying to drive this home? Because there's a doctrine that's been circulating since the 1600s that's really getting popular today, known as monergism. Say that word. Moner, mono. Mono mean what? One. Okay? Monergism. Say it. Now, Pastor Joey, get me confused. I'm trying to make this simple. Now, we do not believe in monergism. We believe in synergism. Let me say that word with me. Synergism. In other words, God's divine sovereignty would synergistically work together 
in conjunction with man's human responsibility. In other words, men must cooperate with God to get saved. God provides the Son, God provides the Spirit, God provides the atonement, God provides the grace, God provides the power, but man's faith must choose to cooperate with that so it can become a reality in his life. Would you say amen out there? So God can work in him, with him, and through him, and save him, and sanctify him. Come on and say amen out there. Now hear me, beloved. Paul here is not teaching some confusing and mysterious high Calvinistic doctrine of election and predestination as taught by the Calvinists, which is known as monergism. Now let me explain to you exactly what monergism uh, teaches, okay? A lot of people today that say, and we believe in God's sovereign grace, so don't we, but they redefine what it really means uh, in the Bible. So we need to understand this. We're trying to grow up as Christians, amen? Now listen to me, beloved. Monogism teaches that God alone, from eternity past, capriciously and arbitrarily in and of himself, sovereignly chose some people to be saved and others to be damned without any person ever having a say in the matter. In other words, it wasn't left up to you whether you and I want to accept the gospel. God already made that choice for you. That, beloved, is wrong. You listen to me. Meaning man was not given the option to believe the gospel, choose to be saved or lost, because Calvinism teaches, monergism teaches, that you are so spiritual. First God has to save you, then God says, now I've given you the grace to believe the gospel. But the Bible says, after that ye believed, after that you trusted, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen? So they fudge the scriptures, and that's what's going on today, beloved. We need to stick as close as we can to what the Word of God has to say. Amen? Because, beloved, I'm saying this, that monergism, or this Calvinistic doctrine, or Reformed doctrine that's circulating through the churches today, like, say, with John MacArthur. And I thank for all the good things he says, but a lot of things he says, you would not touch it. But, beloved, uh, this is a heretical and a damnable and dangerous doctrine of demon, and it's found nowhere in the Scriptures. In God's redemptive plan, beloved, he predetermined that his salvation would be freely given by his grace to any man who placed their faith in Christ. Now listen to me. There can never be true faith. There can never be true love of God. There can never be true worship of God unless and until man has has the ability to make a choice to do that. Otherwise, you're nothing but a pre-programmed robot. You're saved. Okay, I'll walk this way. And yet the God always begs us, he pleads with us to continue to remain, to abide. So it shows you, beloved, that God has provided everything we need for salvation, but we must choose to cooperate with his grace uh, to be uh, not only saved initially, but ultimately, fully, and finally. Amen? Now look at verses 4 and 5, verse 11 again. According as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now I want you to drop down to verse number 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being, is that word again, predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. The word predestinated in this text is the Greek word proorizo. Proorizo, beloved. And it simply means to decree, de, excuse me, to decree or determine God's will beforehand. In other words, see this church right here? You know where this church started this building? In my mind. I took a piece of paper, I sat down, and I drew it. And I knew, the town says that if you go over 10,000, uh, square feet, you have to put it in a sprinkler system. I wanted to put a cellar here so we could have an extra 10,000 feet, but it was just too expensive. You have to put new, uh, more septics in and whatever. But it sat down in my mind. I said, how can we do this? We can have a couple of offices, blah, 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 and I drew it. Now, we worked that plan out, or the, uh, in fact, Doug was the man on the site here, making sure that the architects did what they were supposed to do, amen, and what the builders did, what they were supposed to do. But where did that plan begin? It began in my mind. Where does God's redemptive plan begin? 
It begins in his mind. Now he has to work it out uh, in real life, so to speak, as we're uh, right here. Now, predestinated, meaning God, now listen to me, according to his own divine will, his redemptive plan, determined from the foundation of the world, chose two, two different corporate classes and groups of people to either be saved or lost, depending on their choice to either accept or reject the gospel of his Son as their Lord and Savior. God predestinated and decreed beforehand in his redemptive plan that the whosoever wills who choose to repent and believe the gospel and trust Christ as their Lord and Savior would be saved. They would be adopted into his family and they would go to heaven. You see, beloved, that was already in the plan. Conversely, God also predestinated and decreed beforehand in his redemptive plan that the whosoever wants who choose to disbelieve the gospel and reject Christ as their Lord and Savior, then they would send themselves to hell. Because God says that's what's going to happen if you reject my son. Now the final decision, the final destination that belonged to the group that was predestined and decreed by God to go to either heaven or hell was left to the individual choice of each and every person on this earth. Would you say amen? It's important that you understand that because you're going to be inundated with a lot of this false teaching that's coming forth over the... I can't even listen to it anymore, beloved. I'm the old school. I, I like the big band music. The <laughs> Pennsylvania 650. <laughs> but I can't listen to that stuff anymore because I know it's not true and I don't want anybody trying to uh, reprogram my mind. So in God's redemptive plan, not the man, it's not the man that's been predestinated and decreed beforehand, beloved. God did not arbitrarily choose to save or damn anyone without their choice in the matter. God, yet God in his divine sovereignty did indeed, now listen to me, capriciously and arbitrarily set the rules of his salvation and he foresaw and he foreknew who'd decide to make a personal individual choice to either conform or not conform to his redemptive plan. Because our God is an omniscient God, amen? Our God is a God who knows all things. Now, I told you God created man as free moral agents, beloved, and he left the choice of where you and I would ever want to spend our eternal destiny, up in heaven with him or in hell. God's will is that he wants all men to be saved. God wants no man to be lost. The scripture is so full of that, you'd have to be a blind man not to see it. For example, beloved, because that refutes monogism, by the way. Listen to these scriptures that refute monogism. The Bible says, for example, in John 3, 16, 18 through 36, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But he says, The wrath of God abideth on him continually, in verse 36. The, the Greek literally says, that's what it, Greek literally says, because a, a word abide is a present tense verb. So you can see we have to believe whosoever will. Okay, the Bible's clear on that. That's synergism. Man working with who? God. God has provided everything, but my will must move and choose to do what he says. Come on and say amen out there. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.19 that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Now, the Calvinists would say, all the elect. But the Bible doesn't say that, does it? See, that's just putting your doctrine, superimposing your eisegesis, your subjective beliefs, into a text where you need to exegete it, like that sign exit, go out of, lift objectively out of what that text has to say. Would you say amen? And so we've got to be careful, beloved, because not everybody that says Jesus, Jesus, or Lord, Lord, or Spirit, Spirit, is truly of God or Jesus or the Spirit. Amen? The Bible warns there's a false Jesus, there's a false gospel, there's a false uh, uh, Spirit. And so we need to be, uh, understand that. Now, beloved, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, Paul wrote that God wants all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? How many men does God want to be saved? All men, but not 
all men are going to be saved, not because of him, but because they've chosen not to accept his rules. Okay? God sets the rules. That's the plan. You either decide to conform to it or you choose not to conform to it and bear the consequences of it. Would you say amen out there? Now, <clears throat> I'm trying to move along here with this time. Beat the clock. Jesus said that hell was not made for man, but for Satan and his angels, right? Listen to me. Hell was not made for man. That means in God's redemptive plan, God did not make that for man. That means God did not even make it for the angels until they, what? Sinned. Then God said, hell, all people, that not only the fallen angels are going to go there, but all the people that choose to follow the God of this evil world system and those fallen angels, they're going to go there too. Would you say amen? So it's pretty clear, beloved, as what the scripture says. So if man chooses to go to hell, you listen to me now, he'll be an intruder there. Hence, God has predestinated and predetermined the rules, the terms of salvation, beloved, and not the people who are going to go there. The question is, what decision have you made? Have you chosen to cooperate with God or not cooperate with God? Now, a lot of people, a lot of Christians think it doesn't matter. I'll leave that to you. To me, it does. I don't think that anyone should trifle with the Word of God. The Bible says we need to tremble at the Word of God, doesn't it? But a lot of people trifle with the Word of God, and that can be eternally dangerous because I've showed you before, in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, In that day many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And I will confess unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. So don't trifle with the Word of God. Tremble at it. Remember, eternal life, you can't buy it, you can't earn it. God has given you part of his life. It's invaluable, it's priceless, ladies and gentlemen. And God isn't going to give it out willy-nilly to those who aren't serious about him. But that's what's happened today in Christendom. They just said, are you sad? Uh, would you like to go to heaven? Well, who wouldn't? Just raise your hand and accept Jesus. <laughs> that's not the gospel, is it? Now, beloved, let me illustrate what I'm saying. I'm trying to rush along here. God's predestinated and decreed plan of salvation can be equated to two buses, each going in polar opposite directions to do different predestined places. God predestinated one bus to carry those who choose to believe in Christ through the eternal destiny of heaven, and consequently, God also predestinated the second bus or the other bus to carry those who choose not to believe in Christ through the eternal destiny of hell. God then presents to all people in the world the free ticket of the gospel and salvation and urgently pleads with them to take it so they can be saved. But God does not make that, the cho that choice for us. God has already made his choice. He wants all men to be saved and no one to be lost. Would you say amen out there? That is God's will. Now, in what God does is he begs, he pleads, he asks humanity to choose to either accept that uh, uh, plan of salvation, that gospel, and board the bus that's predestinated and decreed to go to heaven, or reject it and board the bus that's predestinated and de decreed to go to hell. But God has left that decision up to each and every one of us that are here today. So the class of whosoever wills who accept this uh, free ticket of the gospel, beloved, choose to get on the bus going to heaven, whereas those who whosoever won't reject the free ticket of God's salvation choose to get on the bus that's going to hell because of their own bad decisions. Now listen to me. It is the, uh, uh, it is the bus and those who reject the gospel that's predestinated. In other words, let me give it to you uh, simply. Let's say I own two buses. I have one bus it's very comfortable. It's a beautiful bus. It's got air condition. The seats are nice and cushy. You can sit down on it, right? There's wonderful people on it. You can have great conversations. That bus is going to heaven. But I got another bus that's going to the Mojave Desert. This is an awful bus. There's no air conditioning on it. The seats are hard. It's bad. It's hot out, in the Mose out there in the desert. Now, uh, I'm standing there, and I'm saying... 
who wants the ticket that's going to Boston on this nice cushy bus? And so Diana says, Pastor Joel, you know, I'd love to have that. Okay, she takes it. And Katie said, I'd love to have that. And she takes it. Now she's getting on the bus, right? Where's that bus going? I see you paying attention. That bus is going to Boston. Where's it going? Is it a cushy bus, yes or no? Is it a comfortable bus, yes or no? Does it have air conditioning, yes or no? But, you know, let's see, Roger is a rascal. And Roger looks at it and says, I don't want to go to Boston. I said, Roger, you take this ticket. Listen, you have a wonderful time. It's great. Give me that other ticket. Now, that ticket's going where? I've already predetermined that in my mind. I've already predestined that in my mind. But I begged with Roger, Roger, please take this ticket. That's what God does to us. The buses are already predetermined. They're already decreed where they're going to go. But to the passengers, what do you want? Which one do you want to get on? Let's see. Play cards. Oh, ace. Okay, hearts. Four aces in a row. Okay. Full house. <laughs> All right, beloved. So you've got that. That's simple enough. Now, I want you to look at verses 3 and 4a. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, circle this. In Christ. Verse 4a. According as he had cho chosen us in him. You know, I want you to circle that. Notice that all of God's amazing spiritual blessings, benefits, and bounties in heavenly places are found only in him. Him, that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. But to partake of them, then we need to be in Christ. But the $64,000 question is, so how do we ever get into Christ? How do we get into Christ so we can partake of these rich spiritual blessings in heavenly places? Now that's a good question, isn't it? How many want these spiritual blessings? Say amen. Well, for $150, I'll tell you the answer. <laughs> Well, beloved, the Bible says that we get into Christ, now listen to me, by grace through faith at baptism. Did you hear what I said? We get into Christ by grace through faith at baptism. Now, let me prove that to you from Scripture. Now, remember, I don't, want, I don't care about popular opinion. I don't care what any man has to say. When I stand before God, I will answer to God for what he wrote and what I'm preaching to you. And I can tell you this, I am not going to be, I'll say, Lord, you wrote it and you know I preached it. I took the flack, I took the heat. So we need to understand what God has to say, amen? Now the Bible says in Romans 6, 3, for example, I preach it to you all the time, I baptize. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Would you say amen out there? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Bible says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, uh, uh, slave or free, and we've all been able to drink into that one Spirit. Now the Bible's clear on that, Galatians 3, 27. The Bible says, For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Let me ask you something. When and where do you put on Christ, according to that text? At baptism. That's what Paul said to the church at Galatia. The Apostle Paul said to the church of Galatia, Oh, how important it is to know and tremble at the Word of God, not trifle with it. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, it is through faith at the sacrament of baptism when our bodies are washed outwardly and physically baptized and washed in water, and then the Holy Spirit simultaneously, inwardly, and spiritually washes away our sins through the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He baptizes us into the body of my bride of Christ, and we now partake of God's rich spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So the Bible teaches that we get into Christ through faith at baptism, and not just by saying the sinner's prayer like people teach. The Bible nowhere says that, ladies and gentlemen. That came in in the beginning of the 20th century. I don't even have time to explain to you how that happened. And Billy Sunday's the one that really magnified that. And then Billy Graham picked up on that. And I won't get into that because I don't have time, beloved. And not just by accepting Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. How many of you want to accept Jesus in your heart as Lord and Savior? 
Now, we know that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised from the dead, we shall be saved. But that's not the end of it, is it? Because it doesn't say anything about repenting and I must repent. It doesn't say anything there about believing and I must believe. It doesn't say anything about baptism and I must be baptized. So it's what they call a synecdochia, a pot for a whole. One pie, six pieces, okay? The pie of salvation. <coughs> Excuse me. And, beloved, the Bible does not say just raise your hand at church and claim you believe the gospel and you're going to be saved. Nowhere does the Bible teach that. When we do these things, indeed, the Holy Spirit will indeed morally and spiritually awaken us. He'll regenerate, convert us, beloved, but He does not place us into Christ or have our names written in the Lamb's book of life in the New Jerusalem, beloved, unless and until we consummate and demonstrate our faith and uh, baptism, beloved. And now we are not only believing the gospel, we are obeying the gospel. Would you say amen out there? We're not only believing it, what are we doing? We're obeying the gospel again and again and again. The obedience of faith, Paul taught. No merit in the obedience of it. It's the evidence, the expression, and an exercise of a true saving faith. Come on and say amen out there. Now, beloved, listen to me. Hear me now. Unless and until your confession of faith leads you to call upon the name of the Lord at baptism, then you are not yet saved no matter how saved you feel. Balaam's donkey had the Spirit come on him and he spoke in tongues. Was he saved? The Spirit of God came on many people in the Old Testament, beloved, and they weren't saved. But God wanted them to be saved. He wanted them to experience that, to spiritually awaken them so they could be saved. God looking out for our best interest. Amen? So remember I told you, don't ever go by your feelings. Don't ever go by your emotions. Always go by the infallible, inerrant, eternal Word of God. And not just what you feel. I felt a lot of things in my life that have been wrong. I didn't feel like preaching this message, to be honest with you. It's easier to preach the theological students something like this, beloved, uh, believe me. But I want you to hear the word of the Lord. The Bible says, for example, Jesus said this. His great, his great commission, before he ascended to heaven, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Did Jesus say that, yes or no? Now, the church, a lot of people say, no, no, no. What Jesus says is he that believeth is saved already, now should be baptized. Will you stand before Jesus and answer for that one? I won't. Did Jesus say what he mean and meant what he said? One plus one equals two, whether I like it or I don't like it, whether I feel it or I don't feel it, that's a fact, amen? And beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ said this in John, chapters, uh, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, beloved. He said, except a man be born again, listen, he says, of water and of the Spirit, and I'll probably, uh, I don't have time to quote everything. But he says, he'll not see or enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the Jews were very familiar with baptism. If you wanted to join Judaism, you had to get baptized. A convert had to get baptized. A Gentile to become a Jew had to get baptized. John the Baptist had been in the Jordan River hollering out, Repent ye, repent ye, and be baptized for the remission of your sin. So when Jesus said, you uh, must be born of water and of the Spirit, he wasn't talking about that water. Some people said he meant the Word of God. Something critical is my eternal soul, and Jesus is speaking metaphorically to me. And it wasn't uh, the water was uh, used as he was being redundant. Unless a man is born of water, that is the Spirit, and then the Spirit, so he's redundant. Unless a man is born of the Spirit and the Spirit. Or did Jesus just mean what he's saying, saying what he meant? Except a man is born of water and of the Spirit. In other words, when he gets baptized, goes into the water, he is now sealed that Holy Spirit of promise, as Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 1. Amen? Now that's Bible, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care what anybody says. I've defended this before the best theologian you could ever imagine. The problem is, beloved, is there an affiliation to denominationalism, and they fear man more than they fear God. And they're afraid that they're not going to be able to preach to large crowds of people. Well, listen, all I want is to be faithful to Christ. When I go to heaven, I said, Lord, I don't want any more responsibility. I want a floor sweeper. What was that, Lord? Oh, Dave. This is what the Lord wants you to do. I'm just a servant. I did my service down here. Okay. I have no aspiration whatsoever except to cross the finish line. How about you? None. None whatsoever, ladies and gentlemen. I want to be true to the Word of God. I want to be a true minister of the Word of God. 
Now, beloved, in Acts, the Bible says also in Acts 2.38, his Peter is Pentecostal sermon. Now imagine this. Picture this in your mind. Here they are in downtown Jerusalem. Peter is now been filled with the Holy Ghost. He's a dynamo. They hear a rushing mighty wind, like a freight train coming. They see cloven of fire on the apostles' head. Then they see the apostles speaking in 17 different foreign languages. And they, after he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah and that they had crucified the Messiah, they said, what should we do? And in Acts 2.38, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He said, this promise is unto you and to your children, to them who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And as many of them received the word, they were baptized, the Bible said. Now, why do people just say, just believe? Peter said, just believe it. That would have been the easiest thing to do, Amen. 3,000 were saved that day. Can you imagine baptizing 3,000 people? A lot of work, wasn't it? But how bad do you want to be saved? Will you consummate and demonstrate your faith, beloved? Now, what I'm saying is this. It's not what you're doing for Christ at baptism. It's what Christ is doing for you supernaturally at baptism. Baptism is not a human ordinance. Baptism is a Heavenly ordinance. Now, let me ask you this. Could God have saved a Jew under the law without having to bring a sacrifice to the altar? He can save any man any want, any, he can save anyone he wants anytime, okay? But God says, no, 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 this is my plan. I want you, if you really, you, know, you say, well, I believe what you said. I believe that I need to trust you as my Savior. God says, now show me. Bring that lamb. I want you to lay your hands on it, trans- your guilt to that lamb, take the knife and the priest will grab your hand and you're going to cut his throat and you're going to shed blood because there's no remission of sin without the blood. You got that? You want to be forgiven? Yes. Then you need to bring a lamb. A what? A lamb. What do you have to do with it? I have to transfer my guilt. What else do I have to do with it? I've got to slit his, slit his throat. Why? Because there's no remission of sin without the blood. Now that was God's plan. John the Baptist baptized for the remission of sin. Now, who sent John? The Bible says, the word of the Lord came unto John. Would you say amen? The word of the Lord came unto John. The Pharisees, the Bible says, many of the scribes, they did not justify God because they would refuse to humble themselves and be baptized by John, a parapetetic preacher, eating bugs. <laughs> imagine him talking to you and his locust legs sticking out of his mouth. <laughs> Repent. <laughs> Eating wild honey. Well, that ought to raise your glucose a little bit, huh? <laughs> that ought to spike the insulin in your body. Actually, it wouldn't because it's fructose, not glucose. That's another story. Now, beloved, the point I'm getting at is this. Let's look at the Apostle Paul as our prime example. And that's a good thing to do, isn't it? Now, you'll hear, beloved, many times saying that the Apostle Paul was converted on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. But you know the Bible does not teach that. He had a pre-conversion experience with the glorified Christ. And beloved, when he got up, he was blinded physically, he could not see, so he took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. For three days and three nights, Paul started ruminating on what had happened to him. Gee, this I was going to arrest people in Damascus who believed in this Jesus as the Messiah. As I look back at the prophecies of Isaiah and the prophecies of Micah and the prophecies of Jeremiah, I see that this Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And then God gave him a vision as he hadn't eaten for three days, hadn't drank water for three days. God gave him a vision. He says, I'm going to send a man named Ananias to you. And Ananias is going to show you the word whereby you can be saved. In other words, going to preach the gospel to you. And he's going to lay his hands on you, and when he does, the scales will fall from your eyes. You'll be able to see not only physically, but for the first time in your life, Paul, you'll have 2020 spiritual vision. Would you say amen? So, in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, as Paul recounts this, he said, Ananias came into him, and he said, Brother Paul, He says, the Lord has chosen you to hear his word. He's chosen you to become his minister. 
He's chosen you to suffer his namesake. Now listen to what he said. Arise, he says, oh, why waitest thou? Arise and be baptized, calling up, and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And where do you call upon the name of the Lord? Where? At baptism. Listen to me, beloved. Was Paul saved before he got baptized? If he was, why did he say that? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. That means he had his sin, doesn't it? Doesn't it? You see, beloved, people like to fudge and twist, and, you know, we, we have to be very careful uh, with what people are saying. So, uh, beloved, the, the, the point I'm getting is this. It was after he got baptized that he was saved, and he could spiritually see, beloved. So, in other words, what I'm saying to you is God's redemptive plan, and not the man or individual person that has been predestinated and decreed to go to heaven from eternity past. For example... We read this morning in Romans chapter 8 and verse 30. Let me refresh your memory. Paul says, those whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, beloved, without getting technical, this is known in the Greek as three aorist indicative past tense verbs here. Called, past tense. Justified, past tense. And glorified what? Past tense. You got that? All righty. Now, beloved, listen to me. In other words, it denotes an already perfect and past completed action. Now, let me ask you a question. Have any of you here have your body totally glorified? None of us have been glorified yet. We're in the process of it. But all of our imperfections, all of, we're still mortal. We're still corporeal. Until Jesus comes back again, we will not be glorified. Amen? But in God's plan, God looked down the corridors of time and said, I'm calling them. I justified them. I glorified them. See what I'm saying? It's already past tense. Not present tense, what he's going to do. But in his mind, that's what he already planned that he would do. Would you say amen? I'm trying to make this as simple as I can, beloved. Now, the bottom line is this here, because I've got two minutes. (laughs) I was going to give you three points, but I I won't. I'll give it to you. Dave's preaching next week. I'll give it to you. I'll preach next week, Dave. No, I can't, because it's it's on Sunday, right? Okay. I'll preach the preach of the week if I'm still above ground. Now, there's three things I'm going to show you next week from the text that we read. I mean, week after. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> there's three things that I'm going to show you about those in the Beloved. We have been accepted in the Beloved, Paul says. We've been elected in the Beloved, Paul says. And we've been perfected in the Beloved, Paul says. We've been what? Number one, accepted in the Beloved. Number two, we've been what? Elected in the beloved. Number three, we've been perfected in the beloved. Now, if you want to hear the rest of this sermon, you come on back. And if the devil doesn't shake the fire out of me, I'll be here to preach it to you. So, beloved, all that to say, what I'm trying to teach you is listen to what God has to say in his word and don't follow what man has to say. If you stand in the judgment before God and you say, Lord, I preached that he that believe in the baptized shall be saved. Well, why did you preach that, Katie? Well, Gospel of Mark, chapter, New Testament, Katie. Okay. Ah, you said right here in Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, just John Mark, by the way, not John the Apostle, John Mark. You said right here, he that believeth and, that is in addition to this, is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not, that is this that I just said, shall be damned. That's how you should interpret that text. People say, see, all you can do is be damned and not believe. But beloved, again, I can't go into it. There's what they call in in, in Hebraism, uh, parallelism. Synthetic parallelism, antithetical parallelism. You know, I'm going parallel. But if if you interpret it the way most people do, you contradict what line A says instead of line B. He that believeth in addition to that is baptized shall be saved. That's the positive. The negative. He that believeth not this that I just said shall be damned. Right? Because otherwise I'm contradicting because 
and see if I can be baptized? Because he said, all you got to do is be damned and not believe. Beloved, why would you want to be baptized anyways if you didn't believe? <laughs> And I just ran out of time. Okay. Questions? No, that's what I say to my class. Any questions? All right, beloved. I hope this helped you somewhat. Uh, you can ruminate on it. Check me out. Check me out. Check me out. Check me out. I hope you wrote the scriptures down. And uh, I want to encourage you about you. If you accepted Jesus, you're one of those in the beloved. Um, we're on TV, brother. I can't take your question right now. I've answered enough of your questions anyways this week, haven't I? <laughs> All right. All righty, let's go to the throne of grace.